tracks. Why you always gotta pick riff tracks? It's your lucky day. It's time for riff tracks. I'm Faith, and welcome to Faith's Take, where I talk about anything and everything that I find interesting. And welcome to episode 43 of Every Riff Track Short Reviewed, where I take five Riff Track Shorts in chronological order, review them, and give them a rating between one and five, with the points being good, great, awesome, fantastic, and spectacular, because I don't think a bad Riff Track Short exists. In this installment, we see more of the pointy-eared hero of Gotham, find out that we really don't want to know where our meat comes from, learn how to stay employed, and give a begrudging send-off to our old pal Norman. So let's not waste any time and dive right into episode 43 of Every Riff Trek Short Reviewed. Like up to assistant tra- Number 211, Batman, Robin Meets the Wizard from February 11th, 2014. Boxy cars filled with boxy men, Batman. <laughs> If you recall the ending of our last repetitive episode of this serial, Batman and Railroad President Harris were seemingly blown to smithereens inside another old cabin in the middle of nowhere. Now, do the wizard's henchmen stay to check and make sure they're dead? Of course not! This is the Batman serial we're talking about. They run off and don't discover that they forgot about the convenient cellar under the cabin where Batman and Harrison survived the so-called Fatal Blast. Two of the henchmen head into the previously established wizard submarine to go visit their evil boss and tell him the seemingly good news of Batman's demise. Meanwhile, Batman and Robin, along with Commissioner Gordon, come up with a plan to entrap the wizard by having the railroad supposedly give in to his monetary demands. What's causing all this? That's what I'd like to know. World's greatest detective, ladies and gentlemen. Opa! Come on, let's go. Uh, check for bodies? Nah, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> Look, Batman, I know you are happy to be alive, but a full kiss on the lips was just a tad surprising. Batman! I thought that blast had finished you. It would have, if there hadn't been a small cellar under that cabin. That's right. <laughs> Thanks for confirming, old dude. Never mind the car. The boys are going to the new hideout. Report Earl and me into headquarters. Okay. I think the wizard might be overstaffed. The wizard should at least hang a few motivational posters. <laughs> Where's the sub tickets? One reason I'm still alive is that I don't ask too many questions. That was good advice when I started at Rift Tracks, too. Thanks, Kevin. Sure. Are either of you Gabe? No, sir. Then get the hell out! How does he want the money delivered? It's to be an old, unmarked bills, and it's to be thrown from a train at a designated spot. He really I emphasized the old say. part. He loved it's it when the bills have a story. The $5 million he demands will be thrown from a train at a designated spot. Update. Hundreds trampled as all of Gotham rushes to train tracks all over town. Control. The bills have been painted with a radioactive substance. We'll use a Geiger counter and track them down. Exposing supervillains to radiation, that always goes well. Batman and Robin fly over the drop-off site of the $5 million payoff as the wizard's henchmen arrive to pick it up. To get the literal drop on them, Batman bails out of the plane with a parachute. And why does he need to go through all of this for the plan? Just to sneak into the henchmen's trunk while they pick up the money. But after all that complicated work, the bad guys just switch cars and the bat has to bail out before the first car careens down a cliff. He and Robin then just chase down the second car to a random warehouse, and while Batman sneaks inside, Robin gets knocked out by the wizard immediately to the surprise of no one. Batman gets in a scuffle, per the norm, and in the midst of the fight, the money bursts into flames and lights up the entire building. There's another plane about 5,000 feet below us. Also, why don't we use this plane more? Plane. Thank you. Wait, Robin's looking from ground level? Yeah, the plane's actually parked. The gangsters are wondering what the hell it's doing the there. Is headed towards it. I didn't have the heart to tell him that was just a camping backpack. Well, seems like he could have just started there by the bridge instead of in a plane. Oh well, live and learn. Oh, Batman, have some dignity for God's sake, you're Batman! This is car six. Still no sign of Gabe. Observed. Wizard changed it into an entirely different car! That's wizardy as hell! What happened? They transferred the money to another car. Move over. Aw, oh, come on, I got my permit. Shut up, Robin. Sure wrap this stuff up tight. You could be careful with five million bucks, wouldn't you? Let me give you a hand with that, huh? Thought I told you to stand guard. You're not man enough to unwrap money. <laughs> and now, true to the title, Robin meets the wizard. And in true Robin fashion. 
<laughs> he killed him with his fist gun. That's five million? Must be stacks of $80,000 bills. Man, we are quickly running out of hideouts. <laughs> A ridiculously useless plan clearly only existing to fill time, this adventure gets a three and a half out of five. The Dark Knight, who trained for 12 years in the ancient art of sneaking around like a six-year-old at bedtime. Number 212, this is Hormel from February 28th, 2014. Across entire rooms of assembly, or rather, disassembly activity. Dad has opted to dress as one of the wizard's henchmen, possibly Gabe. And here I thought the what is nothing kids were depressing. Here we meet Brad and Greg, a couple of farm boys who want nothing more than to go visit the Hormel meatpacking plant with their father. Every young kid's dream! They write a letter to the company and immediately all their meat-based dreams come true as they schedule a tour. And here, ladies and gents, is where the horror show starts. What's the very first thing the kids see on the tour, you ask? Entire pig carcasses being sliced cleanly in half. And it only goes downhill from here as we see a mildly horrific parade of animal parts being chopped, sliced, smashed, bashed, skinned, and mutilated as the entire 30-minute short goes on. And honestly, if you've got a squeamish stomach or are currently eating literally anything even vaguely related to meat, you may want to skip this one for now. Gee whiz, look at all them Hormel cars. Hormel? Yeah. Wonder what's in them and where they're going. Hormel? Hey, I know what. Let's write a letter and ask if we can visit the plant. Dad'll take us, I bet. Dream big, kids. It's fun to write a letter and look forward to a reply. It's so fun that nobody has done it since around 2002. The Brad and Greg letter receives prompt attention. Dear Brad and Greg, what the hell is wrong with you? We are pleased to inform you that arrangements have been made for you to take a tour of the Hormel plant. Provided you report nothing back to the FDA. Tony Corina arrives to show them through the plant. Tony holds a Guinness World Record for most wrong decisions made in a lifetime. This is the first step in the disassembly of the pork side. Brad and Greg begin salivating and call out for more blood. The development of the ham, one of the first meat cuts to receive attention. Because ham hates to be ignored. Pain uh -huh. yeah. It's the automatic scaling line. We're sorting out some hams, yeah. Back to the pork cut, the story of bacon. The greatest story ever First, told. Spare rib, a high-speed circular knife, uh -huh. cleanly slices the bacon to uniform thickness, about 20 slices per second. Which is about how fast I can eat them. Disassembly process is the separation of the shoulder and front feet from the carcass. And occasionally from the meat packer. Hormel pig's feet are delicacy items. They grace the tables of kings! A series of cooking, filtering, and chilling operations occur before the gelatin is extruded onto a conveyor belt in this spaghetti-like form. Wait, sorry, these are the tapeworms we pulled from the pigs. Eat Hormel! Gelatin is sold to candy and other food manufacturers for, among other things, Colorful and wholesome desserts. Wholesome, not like those trashy hot fudge sundaes you see hanging out by the docks. Pork shoulder and ham meat are taken from this picnic boning line and used for the manufacture of Spam. Picnic boning and Spam in the same sentence. In the Too many funny words, I'm melting down. But together, Kevin. Oh, a medium easy. course plate. And adjustments, if necessary, are made. Oh, oh, the spam cano is about to erupt. And refrigeration until it becomes thoroughly blended. I always order my meat blended. <laughs> the raw material is then pumped. The conveyor lines leaving the cooker. Carry the cans directly to automated equipment for orderly assembly and packaging. Brad and Greg are slightly off camera, banging their heads against the hydrostatic cooking tower. Please, sweet coma, come and take us away. Why? Why did we think we wanted I this? Don't know. And here, halfway through our little tour, we come to possibly one of the most disturbing things shown in any educational short. We see a machine skin entire cow corpses in one swoop. Those removed skins are then dropped into the hide cellar, where they're cleaned and packaged, and I literally can't find the right words in the English language to describe how nasty looking this is. And not even giving the audience a second to collect themselves after what they've been forced to witness here, the short marches on, shoving an obscene amount of meat processing into our faces like nothing life-changingly disgusting was just plastered onto our screens. 
Another area of the Hormel plant to be visited is the, the parking lot as you attempt to flee. Beef operations. <laughs> Two long arms move outward and are affixed to the beef hide. <laughs> this man's constant this nightmares make the Saw movies look like Dora the, the Explorer. Without scoring it. Uh, oh no! Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> uh, the tail! The horrible tail! Oh, the tail! And which pulls. The hides are then dropped to the hide cellar. At the fleshing machine, all residue of fat and impurities are removed. You don't get fired at Hormel, you just get relocated to the hide cellar. <laughs> Next, the hides are stretched out on a table for final trimming. Workers in the hide cellar routinely wake up shrieking about hides. Salt from their beds in the hide cellar. Of course. <laughs> to make certain that the hides... It takes special care at Hormel to meet these very rigid specifications. And the paroled felons and octogenarians we employ put their hearts into every cut. The operator handles the grinding, scaling, and conveying of meat to the blender. Meanwhile, his women's studies degree gathers dust. Spices, formulated in our own flavoring department, are bagged for each particular batch. This batch is oyster flavored. Special order from a the guy named Henry Slink. Are now vacuum mix, and the meat moves to the hopper of the <laughs> stuffing machine. At this point, our lawyers no longer let us refer to it as food. Girls wearing plastic gloves do some manual alignment. Seventy-year-old girls, well, yes. Are vacuum for great chili, lean beef, beans, tomatoes, and exotic spices. Such as salt and pepper. The rich... Moving potatoes. A key to the palatability. Hormel was the first to use this rotocut machine. And the last after Harold fell into it. Quickly cut the meat and <laughs> blend in spices. Yep, it's revolting. Excellent flavor and color are all found in the Hormel family of dry sausage products. And like any family, there are a lot of dark secrets and deep General dysfunction. Office. Despite how yucky, weird, and unappetizing this entire short was, I'm gonna still go on loving burger steaks and bacon, so I guess it wasn't as bad as it could have been. This insane meat-filled film is one of the best Rift Trex has to offer, and I'm easily giving it a 5 out of 5. The Hormel Feed Mill is the next area to be visited by the Rugg family. Who already wishes they'd gone to church, or were dead. To make a correct feed mix. Number 213, Batman, The Wizard Strikes Back, from March 14th, 2014. So, uh, Batman? Yes, Robin? So according to Wikipedia.com, those wearing the mask of Robin have included Dick Grayson, Jason Todd, Tim Drake, Carrie, the list goes on and on. Now, Robin, you know you can't trust anything you read on Wikipedia. Well, I, I just want to know what happened to all those other Robins. Look, no, just sign the damn release forms, will ya? <laughs> After that immediate assault on our senses, let's bring it back down with another Batman short. How does Batman escape the deadly fire from the last short? By just leaving the building. Good to see the anticlimaxes of this serial remain consistent, I guess. Now, having lost the warehouse and the money, the wizard uses his machine to stop all the traffic in Gotham. However, the machine needs so much power, which, keep in mind, comes from freaking diamonds, that it only works for like 30 seconds before traffic can move uninhibited again. While the wizard plans to nab some man-made diamonds, Vicky's brother, who also, keep in mind, was a part of the wizard's gang, calls her begging for help, which she stupidly is ready to give all by herself with no protection whatsoever. Thankfully, our cape crusader overhears her call and follows her back to the harbor club, where they nearly drowned just a few episodes ago. Hey, pointy ears, this is for Batman Forever. There's nothing quite like a well-choreographed fight scene, is there? It's a savage ballet. Mm -hmm. Oh, why'd I wear my cape made of oily rags today? Quick, Cape Crusader, your bat grappling gun! Or the stairs, yeah, you just trudge up the stairs. Leave it to the desk, Carter. Don't you want me to serve it, sir? No, I'm not hungry. Get out. Very good, sir. Serve your own damned pizza lunchable, sir. I'll prove to him that I'm ready to strike back. Oh, so the episode so should have been called The Wizard the Sets Out to Establish His Striking Back Bona Fides. To meet any terms I name. I've stopped the railroads. Now I'll demoralize all traffic. <laughs> In fact, I'm changing my name from The Wizard to The Traffic Demoralizer. Oh, the car's danged moralizer is demoralized again. Oh. 
Why do you suppose the wizard has stopped using his remote control machine? I want your insight as a dissipated gad about. Still a chance he can repair it. Jimmy. It's your brother. Where are you? The world's only Jimmy. I can't talk much. I need help. Is this another trick to trap me? Oh, I swear it isn't, Vicky. Accidentally tied myself up again. All right, where are you? It's the Harbor Club. That means trouble. Batman and Robin have got to follow through. Ah, yes, the Dark Knight's tormented personal mission to follow through. Thanks to Batman nabbing the guy guarding Jimmy and getting him arrested, Vicky and her brother are able to escape, and they all end up in Gordon's office, where Jimmy informs him the wizard's after the synthetic diamonds. Gordon immediately calls to have the diamonds moved to another location, and instead of imprisoning Jimmy for aiding and abetting the greatest criminal in Gotham, he just entrusts him to Vicky. And she trusts Jimmy implicitly, despite all common sense screaming for her not to do so. And of course, he ends up calling fellow wizard henchman Neil the second he has a moment to himself to let them in on where the diamonds are now being placed. As soon as Bruce senses something fishy going on, Batman and Robin are speeding to hunt down the diamond-toting baddies. The wizard ends up having enough power left in the machine to stop their not-Batmobile, though, and they end up having to snag a car from a random citizen. The wizard then hijacks that car with his machine, though, and sends it speeding off a cliffside just as the short comes to an end. Journal of Vicky Vale, intrepid girl reporter. As I crept toward the harbor club, the odors of hooliganism and loaded potato skins mingled threateningly in the air. Hurry up, the guard will be back any minute. Why didn't you call me before this? I'll tell my story at police headquarters. I'll tell, tell it with puppets. I don't know what's going on. What? Batman Kong angry! <laughs> Graduate Manu Ginoble School of Flopping. How did you get in with the wizard's outfit? I thought I was being hired as a pilot for a chartered flight. I'm sort of a freelance a scumbag. What was going on? I suggest you release him to the custody of his sister. It's a good idea. Yeah, he's only lured her to mortal danger twice so far in this series. Maybe third time will be a charm. To settle with that bunch. Oh, I've got to rush these negatives over to the enlarging room. Go ahead, sis. I'll hang around here. I'll be right back. Take your time. Uh, don't stay too long in the enlarging room. Last time you came back the size of a buffalo. Neil, this is Jimmy Vale. Gordon fell for the story. He's having the diamonds moved this afternoon. Steal what from my sister's underwear drawer? Wait till I hear from you. Thanks for telling me. Goodbye. Keeping things light, it's Playboy Millionaire, not Work Boy Millionaire. The man who was guarding Jimmy had blanks in his gun. Blanks? Why? Maybe he wasn't supposed to shoot Jimmy. Oh, I don't get it. Who wouldn't want to Maybe shoot that creep? Escape and tell that story. The teeming urban jungle that is Gotham City. Are you injured? I'm all right. They, they slugged me. Did they get the diamonds? Yes. Yes, they did. So Batman pronounces it diamonds. <laughs> yes, he took diction from Catherine Hepburn. I'll take care of Batman. I'll do his laundry and rub his feet and make him feel loved. Batman! Robin! That's right. We're after some jewel thieves, but our car's been disabled. May we use yours? Sure, hop in. No, I meant we'll take yours and you stay here with ours. And I'm give it a wash while you're gone, would you? Me, none. The wizard has taken control. This will be my most triumphant knob turning yet. Poor Toontas, he just got released from Arkham Asylum. While this entry of the seemingly endless saga is pretty uninteresting, it has some great riffs to offer, and it earns a 4 out of 5. The chase would be more exciting if I could tell the cars apart. Number 214. Norman gives a speech from April 18th, 2014. And now Norman, the man Eeyore the donkey called the most depressing son of a bitch ever. Ah oh, yes, time to get back to our least favorite loser, Norman Krasner. Originally riffed in autumn of 2013 during the Night of the Living Dead live show, this is the last short of the Norman mythos. We've seen Norman struggle through using public restrooms, going on business trips, and even just getting out of airport parking lots. What more could life possibly put this put-upon man through? How about giving a presentation at his nondescript office job? What could possibly go wrong? Everything. Everything can go wrong. First, the building's janitor barges into clean while he's still working and does nothing but vacuum up his slides and generally make things worse. After finally going home for a few brief hours of sleep, Norman has nightmares about the looming speech in the morning. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been given an advanced copy of Norman's speech. Not surprisingly, it's simply uh, written 300 times. Hmm. That's what passes for a smile with him. And don't forget, you have to write a 10-minute speech it summarizes the entire presentation. In Latin. The big bosses will be there, so don't screw up. Or else. You're sleeping on the couch tonight. 
Is Norman writing the Declaration of Independence? <laughs> there it is, <laughs> the most despairing sound ever produced by a human. Ugh. <sighs> Whoa, they're going to have a moan off. She is totally throwing down. And there goes the only definitive proof of Bigfoot. Ugh, now where the hell is my dignity? Don't screw up. And for God's sake, stop dreaming about me, you creep. While getting ready in the bathroom, as if we haven't seen Norman in bathrooms enough in these forsaken pieces of media, his papers all land in the toilet. Once he gets to the office, he trips and falls, ends up needing crutches, and is still expected to deliver the presentation that afternoon. Once he finally makes it up to the podium, the mic doesn't work, he knocks over his own easel, he gets laughed at by all of his co-workers, and to top it all off, the fire alarm goes off as the credits start to roll, and Norman stumbles off the stage. And what an appropriately depressing way to send our acquaintance Norman off into the ether. Okay, it all makes sense now. He's Charlie Brown's dad. Yes, no day with Norman is complete until he roots around in the can. All right, time to hop in the bathtub with that thing and end the Norman saga. So you, you beat the charges! Huh? Norman's whole life is like the before part of an infomercial. Is being Norman getting to be more than you can handle? Crutches from that fall? And on top of everything, Norman has hollow bones. Thank you, Barbara. <clears throat> so, uh, why do we drive on parkways but try to kill ourselves by leaving the engine running in the garage? Huh? These Apple keynotes just aren't the same without Steve Jobs. No. Oh God, he's got a detonator! Run! Uh, ladies and gentlemen, that's the fire alarm you're hearing. So we'll have to leave the building in an orderly fashion. Hundreds perished in the Panic. ensuing stampede, and Norman was burned in effigy nationwide. Please form a single. Norman Krasner will return in Norman Discovers Google Chrome's Incognito feature. As the Norman Quadrilogy finally limps to a close, I've got to give its last short a three and a half out of five. Folks, there are no credits in a Norman short. There is only scrolling blame. That's the coat closet. Number 215, How to Keep a Job from April 22nd, 2014. Bob's a good man to watch. As soon as he trains somebody to take over here, he's moving up to assistant purchasing manager. The job he'll die in. Say, that's great. Currently, employment's pretty dang high here in the good old U.S. of A., and that's definitely nice to hear. But how do you keep your job once you've got it? Well, that's what our friends at Cornet are here to share with us today. We open with a young man with a ridiculous name hunting for a job having just gotten sacked from his old one. During his interview to shipping company, all he does is bash the company he used to work for and question why he was fired in the first place. The manager he's speaking with decides to tell him a parable about two of his own employees, twin brothers Bob and Walter. While Bob works hard to keep on top of things and do things to the best of his ability, Walter does the bare minimum but skates by simply since the company doesn't mind wasting money on his lazy butt while they're in the black. Good job, huh? Well, if it's anything like my restaurant job, all you have to do is not get caught in the walk-in cooler barefoot eating coleslaw directly from the container. Absolutely no ambitious young broads. Edward W. Blasley? No, of course you can't work here. Edward W. Blasley. <laughs> you worked there for 18 months? Yes, sir. Why did you leave? Leave. This guy is forcibly anywhere. removed from After every structure months, he ever enters. More than they were paying me. Were you fired? Well, mocked, beaten, then fired, yes. Yes, I was. But it wasn't my fault. The company just up and started firing people. And for some reason they, they started with you? What did I do? Don't I seem like a sharp, industrious character? That's the time to begin this business of keeping a job. Sorry about the emphasis. I'm trying to get into and announcing. That's the time, Bob. We could depend on him to be on time and to do his work on time. Shipping our one you box. You might call him an eager beaver. But look at it from the employer's point of view. Wouldn't you like to have Bob working for you? No, no, I'm scared of beavers. You know he would do his share of the work and help others who needed help. 
He craves human contact so much he'll do anything. Another way to keep... Who should come into the shipping room but me? I had hit my head in the bathroom and was wandering around lost. To find out. <laughs> and it wasn't the first time he tried to alibi his way out of a situation. But alibi or no, it was straight was, to death row. Walter just... Our little wannabe worker asks why the heck a guy like Walter got to keep his job. A fair question, I might add. One that applies to lots of jobs with lots of Walters. Apparently Walter wasn't always as useless as he looked, as he asked for an efficient change that immediately improved the productivity of him and his work. Interesting for Cornette to jump into the world of fantasy fiction like that so suddenly, but okay. However, Walter's high doesn't last too long, as he almost instantly goes into complaining about his job to a random delivery man who passes through the office. After hearing all this, Edward admits to being a Walter himself and wanting to change, and is hired on the spot, because that's how employment works. He gets taken out to meet Bob to start training, and discovers Shyamalan Twist! Bob doesn't have a twin named Walter. Walter's lazy behaviors were actually just Bob's before he took his job seriously. Why didn't you go ahead and fire this, uh, Walter? Now, don't be too hasty. I'm only telling you about Walter's bad points. He did enough work to hang on to his job. <coughs> Bribes. <coughs> As long as times are good, there'll be jobs for fellows who just barely do enough to get by. Jobs at the DMV and but to cable keep a companies. Job when gets... It's not hard to understand why he was unhappy whenever shipments were left just inside the door. Was it because his high, tight pants the were breaking his ribs? To be hauled all the... If you don't like the way things are done, you can spend a lot of time complaining about it. Sounds great. Yeah. That was Walter's. You... Walter's idea was a practical one. So we adopted it. I'm just kidding. That suggestion box is really a shredder. Saved and left. What you got there? Shipment for you. <laughs> Wise guy. Why is a policeman delivering packages anyway? <laughs> well, everybody runs around like crazy. No system. And nobody in charge with enough brains to start one. Should never put what the scarecrow in charge. <laughs> Guess it's not very different from the way I was talking to you. About the place where I used to work. Well, there's a saying... If the shoe fits. Oh, the shoe fits, all right. Good, because I was going to say, if you the shoe fits, be. go buy me a bottle of scotch. Yep. I, come on. Yes, sir. I'm going to show you a room we call the hide cellar. Oh, the tag. Mr. Wiley's been telling me about you and your brother. My brother? Did you hear from the kidnappers? Yeah, your twin brother, Walter. I uh, had a point to make, so I invented a twin brother for you. <laughs> Wrote a whole series of erotic see, fanfics about the two box, of you. <laughs> I, was real I hope you already have a plan for keeping your job, since I don't think the short will actually help you any. But despite its uselessness, it gets a four out of five. I didn't do anything. Why me? <laughs> I think you, you just answered your own question. You hadn't gotten anywhere. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and special thanks to all my delightful Patreon supporters, including Jackie Ball, Kevin Nata, Victor Cordova, and Tony Briscato. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and get ready, since I'm already planning all my Halloween reviews for October. I should have some really fun videos coming out your way, both reviews as well as some reactions to Halloween Rift Tracks I haven't seen yet. And if you're wanting some extra Rift Tracks goodness from me, head over to my Out of Context Rift Tracks Twitter page. Go give it a follow at No Context Rift if you want to get some extra Rift Tracks goodness in your lives. Thanks again! And I'll see you guys later. It's time for Rift Tracks. A ridiculously... A ridiculously... <laughs> Apparently Walter wasn't as always... <laughs> Apparently Walter wasn't as always... Oh my gosh, wasn't... <laughs> After hearing all of this, Edwa immediately... Nope, <laughs> that's not the word. After hearing all this, Edwa... Oh my gosh, not immediately... It's admits, not immediately. <laughs>